Oh, so you'll be on the screen. Today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this morning. It is good to see all of you here. Today is World Communion Sunday, uh, a day that celebrates the bond that all of us as Christians share all over the world. Uh, we, we recognize a little part of what we say in the creed when we believe in the communion of saints. All those who call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior have a bond that is unique, uh, even though we may be quite different in every other way. So we will be celebrating communion today and also thinking about the common link with all those other people around the world uh, and in communities uh, near and far. So we will invite you to come forward to partake of the elements when we get to that point in the service as has become our custom. A number of announcements uh, that I want to make and that I want to point you to a couple of things that are in the newsletter uh, that you should either have received or will be receiving soon. And if you do not, please let us know and we will make sure you get one. We are announcing the start of what we're calling the Legacy Fund, a special uh, fundraising effort to build some endowment for our congregation to ensure that our ministry is good and strong into the future. There's some details of that in the newsletter. You'll be hearing more about it in the coming months, uh, but we will run this campaign from now through next October and conclude uh, next uh, October, uh, the end of the month, uh, Reformation Sunday uh, next year. So be looking for more on that and please be in prayer about how you might contribute to it. Um, on the 31st of this month, we will be celebrating Reformation Sunday 
And we're designating also Heritage Day for our congregation. Uh, we're going to be inviting guests who are former members, former ministers, uh, and, and as well as all of you who regularly worship here, and we will be celebrating our heritage as Presbyterians. There's going to be some very special music that day, as well as the other elements of worship, but also celebrating 200 years of worship and ministry in this place, in this congregation. I think we're actually close to 202 years now. We were trying to do this uh, some time ago, but COVID has delayed it, and um, so we are, uh, but we don't want to miss the occasion. Uh, finally, next week, the Reverend Dr. Paige Creech will be here. Um, someone earlier referred to her as the other half and said, I don't want to call her the better half. And I said, well, you can call her that. That's fine. Uh, she looks forward to being with you next week, and I will be with her congregation at Noblestown. Let us worship God together. to walk the faithful road and to choose the way of God's justice. We are here because we believe strongly that our God is good and that we live in that goodness. We are here to proclaim our faith and to seek the rest along the state of journey. Come together then to be God's people. Follow Christ and listen to the good things that God has done. Rise up in praise and thanksgiving. We will share with others the goodness that we have found in God. May our lives be an expression of our goodness. <laughs>
Join me now, please, in prayer and confession. My dear Heavenly Father, you have shown us your love and called call us to be of your service. But we have made ourselves too busy and worried to confess. Like Martha, we have been anxious about much we cannot control, and we have forgotten you. We have been worried about what other people think of us, and we have missed the point of repairing. We resent the merits of that for you. Trust in your grace. We are angered by people who serve us across the tension away from us. Forgive us, God, that we have prayed for the wrong things. Forgive us, body and soul, for your service of love and grace. Amen. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has passed, a new life has begun. Be assured that in Christ Jesus you have been forgiven. Glory be to God. Reading the scripture reading from Psalms 8, 
O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark to cause your foes, to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the fields the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. We'll be reading the first four verses of chapter 1. And then chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory, and is the reflection, he is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Chapter, five, chapter 2, verses 5 and following. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we were speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The question, who are we? That is, who are we human beings and what place do we have in the world? Is a question that comes back again and again. In every age, people can't resist asking the question. I suppose it's because we human beings are such a mix of evil acts and intentions, and good acts and good intentions, wonderful potential, but tremendous failure, all rolled up into one in each and every one of us. So the question comes in the midst of all of that, who are we? What is our true identity? There are some nihilistic philosophers who ask that question and answer it by saying, we are really nothing. Look at our lives, they are meaningless. We have nothing to offer, nothing really matters, they say. 
we can see, too, why they might say that. There are even some places in Scripture where the authors seem to go in that direction. Think about the writer of Ecclesiastes, who often seems like he is at the end of a very, very bad day, who says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What's the meaning of it all? And at one time in the book, he seems to throw up his hands and say, humans and animals, what's the difference? We all die alike. But when we muster up our faith, when we recognize there is a God, there is a creator, and there is meaning in this life, we begin to think differently and better about who we are. But then the question comes in a little different form. The form that we haven't asked in our psalm this morning, not just who are we, but who are we before God? Who are we in the world that God made and put us in? In this form, the question is asked and we might still answer it with despair. Biblical writers sometimes seem to do that when they focus on how inadequate we are standing before the holy God this one who is so holy he cannot look upon our sin. And the biblical writers sometimes confess, I am but a worm. I am a wretched creature. I can't do the good I know I should do. And the evil I know I should not do, that's what I end up doing. Sinful through and through. We could get that impression if we read select passages in our Bibles. All of that is true, of course, about all of us, but the Bible begins with a very different testimony about who we are. When God introduces the intention to make us, God says, let us make humankind in our image. And so it says, God made human beings made all of us in God's image according to God's likeness. And one translation that's quite popular has it that when God did this, God looked at us and said, outstanding. There are a couple of problems with this though. It never says what it means that we're made in God's image. And an even greater problem is that soon after this high point of creation, when God declares we are made in God's own image, human beings begin to turn to the bad, turning against God, turning against each other, killing each other, being cruel to one another. And scripture recounts this downward spiral of humankind to the point that the earth is completely wrecked and God looks at it all and says, I'm not so sure I should have done this. Maybe I just need to start over. So it's appropriate that the psalmist ask, what are humans that you pay attention to them? Church father Irenaeus said, we are indeed made in the image of God, but that image is so tarnished in us that we can hardly recognize it, we see it only dimly. So what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? In those questions the psalmist asks, the psalmist also draws up again all of the weaknesses and limitations that we have. He identifies us as Adam, mortal. In this word, we find a label for us that's closely related to the word that means earth, Adama. For we read in that second chapter of Genesis that God formed human beings from the dust of the ground. And so every time we gather at the graveside, we remember this, 
that from dust we came and to dust we return. This language reminds us of how limited we are. We are children of the earth. The other term for a human being, enosh, is a word that means weak and frail. And we all know as we get older how true that is, don't we? Our bodies fail us. They begin to fall apart. And so the psalmist asks, what are human beings, Lord, that you would give them any regard at all? And if you read through the book of Psalms, begin at the beginning and read to the point of this psalm we've read today, you see even more how we might question what good we are. For the first seven psalms is filled with trouble and woe and complaint. The psalmist seems to always be in trouble and cry out to God in pain, in sickness, being attacked by enemies, being done wrong by other people. Lord, won't you do something about all of this? No wonder that Job asked this same question the psalmist asked, what are human beings, Lord? And when he asked it, he seems to note the claim that we are made special and then sort of ask God, Lord, if this is a privilege, I could use a little less of it because things aren't going too well for me. And as Job, the psalmist, recognizes that in the vast universe that God has made, we are but a tiny speck. We are so insignificant. Look at the world you've made, the wonders your hands have created. What are we in the midst of all that? A story a couple of years ago about a man who was on a boat in the Indian Ocean and he fell overboard and no one knew it. He was all by himself on the back of the boat when it happened and he recognized that it might be days before anyone passed by and was able to rescue him. He floated in the Indian Ocean for 48 hours praying, hoping that someone would spot him. But he recounted what happened at night as he floated there on the waves and he looked up at the stars that came out so brilliantly above him. And he recognized the vastness of it all and said, I am just a tiny little speck floating on the water here. I am really nothing. We could look at it all and say, that's who we are. The psalmist recognizes all of that and draws all that up for us, but then as if to bring us back, says, and yet, God has made these human beings, God has made you and me just a little lower than God himself. Now when the psalmist says this, the word he uses for translated in the reading that Cheryl did this morning, God, is a simple word, Elohim. It can actually refer to the one true God, but it can also refer to divine beings, to angels. And so some of our older translations render it angels. And you may know this psalm by those translations it would become a reason for some reflection by early Christians of how we are related to the angels and stories spun out of this about how the angels became upset when God created human beings, made lower than them, but God seemed to give humans special privileges and the angels began to complain and rebel against God's actions. The point here though, is that far from being worthless or tiny little creatures who have no significance, God has given our lives tremendous meaning. God has in fact created us and put us here to stand in for him in the creation, to represent him, his intentions, to make his way known 
in the creation. This is, it seems, what it means to be made in the image of God. The psalmist says as much, and it applies to every one of us, to you and to me. No matter how limited we might feel, whatever we face, you and I are made in the image of God. And the psalmist says, he has crowned us with glory and honor. This is one of the most remarkable statements of, about who human beings are that has ever been made. For you see, in ancient Egypt, there was a lot of talk about being made in the image of the Egyptian gods, but it was only Pharaoh the king who was said to be made like that. Everyone else stood under him. Or when the people in Mesopotamia told stories about the origins of human beings, told stories about their gods and their battles in the heavens, According to them, human beings were made because the gods were tired of doing their manual labor, and so they made humans to do the dirty work for them. The opening of our Bible, and here the psalmist says, no, no, you and I are made just a little lower than God and put here to stand in for God, to be the one he has appointed over everything. He has put all things under our feet, the psalmist reminds us. Now, what is it that sets us apart? People have wondered this for ages. Is it our creativity? Is it our intellect? Is it our ability to make moral decisions or to have a relationship with God? No one's ever been able to answer that question. It is simply a fact that is stated. We are made a little lower than God, and God has put us in charge of it all. More than an identity, though, maybe, this is our calling. When we wonder on some dark day, what place do I have? What purpose does my life represent in the world? The answer is right here. And so if we make mistakes and, as our culture has taught us to do, explain it by saying, well, I'm only human, this psalm would seem to suggest that's not the right answer. We should never say, I'm only human. In those lowest moments, we should say, I have here become less than what God wanted me to be. To say, I am human says that I bear the very image of my Creator. And so, it may be a little scary when you think of it that way. This responsibility to care in the world as God cares in the world. Every once in a while, I think we, we get it. Buzz Aldrin, who was a good, is a good Presbyterian, when he landed on the moon, the first time humans, time humans arrived there, he carried with him a copy of this psalm that we have read this morning. And as they sat there before departing the module to go onto the surface of the moon, he read it out loud. Would later put it in a time capsule to remember that occasion. That despite the fact that we look so tiny in God's creation, especially from the vantage point of outer space, looking back on the earth and looking out at the universe. God has put us here for this high purpose to govern the world and to care for it. Of course, we also often miss it, both in our fear of this identity we want to shrink away and not take responsibility that God has given us, or we just act badly, failing to care for all that is put in our charge as we should. And so, I think, at least in part for that reason, 
the writer of Hebrews brings this passage and this identity up again and reminds us what this should look like for us. For if we are put here to represent God, we should be doing the things that God would do if God could act like a human being in relationship with other humans, in our community, in our world. And Hebrews says, indeed, we have seen what this looks like because the one who bears the image better than everyone else is the one who God sent in the flesh to represent himself, Jesus Christ our Lord. And what did he do to show us what the image of God means and what our true identity is? Jesus would say to his disciples, you have not come to be served, but to serve. And he showed that and proved that by giving himself away completely, even to the point of death for you and for me. And because of this, because Jesus so fulfilled what it means to be a human being, writer of Hebrews says, he calls us sister and brother. He has so entered into our lives and identified with us and taken on this identity. And so he shows us the way. Who are we? Who are you? Who am I? You're made just a little lower than God. And God has put all things under your feet. Amen. our worship service, we respond to the hearing of God's Word in various ways. One of those ways is for, uh, for us to affirm with the church through the ages what we believe, who God is, and who we are in relationship to God. We do that most weeks by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me as we say it together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us continue to give thanks in response to God's word by thanking God for the gifts of God's people to make possible the furtherance of the, of the gospel in our world. Let us give thanks. thanksgiving for the grace that you have shown to us and may our lives be expressions of thanksgiving and praise that everything we say and do might be a gift to you in the name of Christ we ask these things amen Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who take refuge in him. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Learn of me. Take my yoke upon you, and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The table that we have before us is a table set by Christ himself. The invitation to us to come and to dine with him is from Christ himself. This is the table of Christ, and all who seek him as Savior and Lord are welcome here. Let us lift up our hearts and let us give thanks. The Lord be with you. Also lift up your hearts. O oh, holy God, you who have saved us and redeemed us from all our sins, we do give thanks to you and lift up our hearts to you, remembering how you created us, making us in your image, creating us for your purpose to live with you, even though you are holy and we could not sustain holiness before you. But we realize that you who are set apart, you who came with all goodness have created us, and so we declare with myriads of angels and those through the ages, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. We remember, O oh God, how when your people failed to worship you in spirit and in truth, how they failed to maintain themselves as the priestly kingdom you called them to be. You did not give up on them or turn your back on them, but you came instead in the flesh, in the form of a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who bore your image, who worked out your purpose, who depended on you fully and completely, and who in so doing showed us your true nature. We remember how he was obedient to you even to the point of death even death on a cross. And because of his obedience, 
because he bore your image perfectly and completely, because he showed that you are one who are giving and forgiving, you who pour yourself out for us as he poured himself out for others. You showed us the way to salvation and the newness of life. You showed us how death itself might be overcome. And so we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. O oh God, because we know that Christ has come for us and poured out his lifeblood for us, we dare lift up the needs of our hearts, the concerns that we have for other people and for our world to you. And we also pray for ourselves that you might make us what you want us to be. As we do, we name those who have been given to us in recent days to care for and to pray for. We ask that you continue to be with Chuck as he awaits and faces transplant surgery. We give you thanks for Ruth and for her recovery from the hospital. We ask that you would continue to be with Harry Thompson, whose stay in the hospital has brought him home now and as he recovers. We pray that you would be with the family of Cindy Hallenstein, especially Jenna Steele and her siblings as they mourn her passing. We ask that you would be with all these and attend to these needs and be at work in the world as we know you are already. Healing divisions, working to make peace among people who are divided from each other, working to bring purpose where there seems to be none. We know that this will all be possible completely, only when your kingdom comes. But we wait for that and pray for that and ask that you show us how we might be part of it and see signs of it even now. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who also taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture says, On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus was at a meal with his disciples. And after the meal was over, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The bread and the cup are the gifts of God for the people of God. The meal that he has set before us, would you come and join Christ here who has invited you?
Let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for the way that you have fed us with your presence, represented by the bread and the cup. We ask that you now send us forth by the power of your Spirit, that we might proclaim with our lives, with our words and our deeds, your goodness to the world, giving testimony that you are redeeming us through Jesus Christ, and you were at work to redeem the whole world according to the work that Christ has done, his death and his resurrection. We ask these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Mm -hmm. Spirit to love and serve the Lord. And as you do, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and forevermore. Amen.